you earned four hundred thousand dollars on one case by the one way case. i want to throw that out there because that is freaking legendary bruce I, thank you i can't say it and i don't know two people that can ever say something like that that is nuts how did you earn 400 grand on one well, single case i don't want to give all the secrets away then nobody will come yeah. to the breakout session right but that's true. it was it was a uh, a high level estate planning case I was doing retirement planning seminars and this couple came and they had a $5 million stock portfolio. All right, my buddy Bruce is in the hot seat today. Mr. Bruce Weinstein, how are you, sir? Great, great. Thank you. Excited Dude, to you be here. You've been in and around the business for 30 years. Almost 35. Almost 35, <laughs> almost equal to my age. So you know far more than I do. So take it easy on me today, okay? Because I know right. you could you could talk over my head in a hurry, right? Because one of the things I've learned about you is you're extremely impressive. You know products crazy well. And your spirit experience comes from a lot of facets, right? And, and, and a lot of um, experience in different products and financial right. advising and insurance and all this stuff. Uh, have you always been like this product guru all along? Yeah, I think I started in the brokerage industry in 86, 1986. Wow. <laughs> and I was doing consulting planning conversations back then versus just trying to sell. Everybody was given a pitch, a Merrill Lynch pitch, yep. and you, you had to just try and make that sale. And I was always trying to probe and uncover if it was a, a mom answering the phone, a woman answering the phone during the day, you kind of figured it was a mom staying home, you would shift to college planning. You know, if it was, you're calling the senior communities, we always were talking municipal bonds back then. So, but I always tried to consult and it was way ahead of its time. And then in the 90s, the financial planning approach came about. And so I was probably about 12 years ahead of the curve in regards to just being consultative, which is the topic of my breakout session. If I could throw that in, it's, are you selling or are you solving? Yeah. And, and the, the way that came about is I'm excited for your breakout session, eight percent nation, by the way, it's going to be unbelievable. Um, you guys have to go to this breakout, trust me. Um, because you, you, you've, you've earned, you earned $400,000 on one case, by the one way. Case. I want to throw that out there because that is freaking legendary, Bruce. Thank you. I, I can't say it. And I don't know two people that can ever say something like that. That is nuts. I also just heard you talk about planning is so I'm so, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, okay, should we call it planning versus pitching? Cause if you're not planning, you're pitching, right? right or, right. or, or tr a transaction versus transformation um, or consulting versus for versing just cranking out policies. So there's my little comparisons there as I'm thinking, right. I'm talking to you. Yeah. Uh, how did you earn 400? How did you earn 400 grand on one single case? I don't want to give all the secrets away that nobody will come yeah. to the breakout session. Right. But That's true. it was, it was a, uh, a high level estate planning case. I was doing retirement planning seminars and this couple came and they had a $5 million stock portfolio mm. that had a cost basis of $8,000. So and the ex previous explain, explain cost basis for us that have sure. no clue what that means. Thank you. So basically the stock was to them was an $8,000 acquisition price and the street value was $5 million. So liquidating, transferring the stock, closing the stock out would trigger a capital gain, a taxable event of literally $5 million. And at that particular year, capital gains tax was 28%. So nobody before us ever initiated the conversation to sell the stock because they're going to give up $1.4 million in capital gain tax. Yeah. So the portfolio manager was just keeping the stock and collecting a dividend. Uh, without giving away too much of the details, this stock became Wachovia stock, which had a 5% dividend. So the client was living on that dividend. And as you know, with the financial crisis, Wachovia stock plummeted 98%, eliminated the dividend. And if they had not met me and done this work that I had done pre-financial crisis, their $5 million would have been worth about $100,000. Ooh. 
So it is a lot of winds of what transpired and why you diversify and why the strategy we did, which used an annuity, used an islet trust. So it was a big life insurance case. It was a big annuity case. And having the toolbox to know and understand the techniques in estate planning. Yeah. Uh, not many people are familiar with what's called a charitable remainder trust, which is what we used. And it was a lot of bells and whistles. And I would say less than one tenth of 1% of financial advisors out there even know the terminology, let alone the strategy. So it was, well, it was a big win. It was a big o- win. Only 50% of the people on this call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not on this side. In case you're <laughs> uh, so selling versus solving. I love that. You, you talked about a toolbox. How important is it for a rep to have a toolbox uh, of like an arsenal, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I came to uh, Nate's event right, SWAT, and you, Pete, Brad Hannon, you know, a bunch, everybody was kind of on a topic, right? Health, life, Medicare, um, specific tools in the toolbox. And why I knocked on the door to see about speaking at your event was to bring a bigger array of tools, right? Is there's more to uh, the the problem solving. Uh, The backstory I'll give you is a buddy of mine lost his job and was going to get into, he tells me, long-term care sales. And he knows nothing about insurance. He certainly knows nothing about long-term care. And I said, let me ask you something. I said, if you're in a hardware store and you're only selling screwdrivers and the guy comes in and wants to buy a hammer, are you going to tell him just to use the hammer, use the screwdriver as a hammer, or are you going to be able to find him a hammer? So if you're only selling long-term care and they need final expense, they need uh, an estate plan, they need health insurance, they need Medicare, you're you're letting that person walk out the door. So for me, as a financial advisor, capacity over the years, my toolbox was constantly being added on to this, this child remainder trust. I went to a workshop in Indianapolis in the 1990s to learn about and study and get certified on this estate planning technique. So Hmm. for me, it was always a matter of being as well-rounded and conversational with anybody in any circumstance. I won a $5 million case from a Merrill Lynch uh, competitor as I sat down with the prospect who came to my, I did retirement planning seminars for many years. And as the person was pulling stuff out, I was telling him what he had. He's like, how do you know about that? How do you know about that? And I said, (laughs) I said to him jokingly, I said, I'm not here to crack walnuts, man. I know my stuff. Like, (laughs) let's get serious. Like, do do you want to work at the professional? Because but he was like dumbfounded, like why or how I knew yeah. about all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a professional. So I want to add to that. I want to add to that real yeah. quick because I love that you just said that. Like that is so key for you guys taking notes. I hope hope you're taking notes, listening and watching this as as, as um, after we put this out is a pro versus an amateur. You know, like a lot of people in our business are amateurs. That's why they fail. They never become part of the 8%. They never become Bruce freaking Weinstein because <laughs> they're – amateurs instead of being a consummate professional and knowing their stuff and knowing their game. Uh, how important is it to seek out being a true professional and going at this thing like it's a real career versus just a side job? Well, I think for a new person, if you're going to start somewhere, you can't know everything immediately. That's right. Right. So you, you definitely need to become an expertise in one particular area first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, again, side story, my son was interning with interning with me one summer and I had him sit in on client interviews, post seminar coming in now to to undercover their situations, their pain. And to the better part of a three hour conversation, he looked at me as like, I, I can never get into the business. Mm. I said, why? He goes, you talked for three hours. He says, you had so much wealth of knowledge and information that the conversation just kept going and going and going and probably too overkill, obviously on my part, I'm a talker, but to the point of the client and the situation, there was a lot to uncover and a lot to uh, share with them. And so it was intimidating to him as somebody considering getting in the business because how am I going to learn all that? And I said to him, it took me 30 years. Like, you know, it took me 25 years to know all that. I didn't know that 1986, when I started at Merrill Lynch, it took decades. So yes, uh, I, I think anybody who wants to get into the business with what's out there today, whether it's, you know, health, Medicare, final expense, you know, life products is just dive into something, 
Yeah. Start to get to critical mass, make a living, see that you're having success, and then work on personal growth and expansion to say, now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to get into, if I'm in health, I got to get to Medicare. I yeah. want to train. I don't want to lose those clients to Cody because they're going to go, you know, to the gurus for Medicare. I want to be able to transition that client, right? So right. what do I need to do to put myself in that position and, and educate myself? So, you know, for us, it was just a constant um, evolution for our practice is just be, you know, we, we kind of say the line, all things insurance. So it doesn't matter. We don't say no to anything. We have strategic partners. PNC. PNC. We don't do, we're not writing PNC. We're right, licensing right. PNC. But part of my, you know, with, with Dave and Joe Campert and others in the PNC yeah, space yeah. is to be strategic partners because as I'm networking and having clients and they might be in Austin or Dallas or, you know, Kansas yeah. City, and they say, can you help me with blank? Because I'm the resource, I'm the quarterback, right? I'm the navigator mm -hmm. of the ship. Yeah. I don't say no. I say, I've got a strategic partner. Let me bring them into the conversation. That's and, awesome. I work, and I work that out with Joe or Dave or somebody to yep. facilitate, be involved, and still be the lead dog on the relationship because the clients came to me for that trust factor. That's smart. And what do you sell the most of? These days, probably, I would say life is is the life and annuities is the the bigger ticket in that regard. Health and Medicare are smaller ticket stuff. It takes stacking uh, and volume. But as I have evaluated, I'm, I'm thanks to you guys, you know, you and and Nate, uh, you know, working with Coach Bert and and diving in deeper into my own you know brain. But yeah. looking at my 80-20 and where my business is coming from and identifying those relationships, it's natural market. You can buy leads all you want. Yes. It's natural market. That's what that's what's getting the better deals. I wrote over eight thousand dollars of premium last week with one of my fraternity brothers who came knocking. You know, wow. what, what does Coach Bert say? Become a person of Interest. Interest. Have them come to you. So I'm doing the stuff that you and Landon and others are out there doing and promoting. I'm trying to follow the people who are having success on this side. Yeah. Right. And so I'm doing the types of things and trying to execute. Nothing works perfect, but my in inbound opportunities are coming from people saying, hey, can you help me with, I don't need health insurance, but can you help me with this? Right. And that's a nice deal. $8,000 premium. So yeah, that, that doesn't suck. That doesn't hurt. <laughs> are, 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 is there, and are you going to share um, the secrets of how anyone can do this um, at, at the conference? 8% uh, nation? 8% nation. <laughs> what is this 8% nation you speak yeah, of? Yeah, exactly. What is this 8% thing? Are, are, is it, I mean, talk to me about what you're going to share there because – I love breakout sessions because it gives people like you that have a ton of experience, ton of knowledge, super impressive people that make a killing the chance to actually teach others how they can do the same thing. Uh, you, you can't see my desk, but I have all my little blue note cards, thanks to Nate and, and the conference at SWAT. Yeah. And yeah. I've been jotting and writing and, again, taking that information and Coach Bird and, and putting down my um, – I'm an outline guy. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not a script person. My seminar, I would speak for two hours off of a eight or 10 item outline. And I would just wow. converse. I would just converse on my journey of this financial planning conversation and yep. lead them through the steps and the process uh, of what I did. And so uh, I'm, I'm not big on repeating myself <laughs> and being scripted. So yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's very conversational. And it's always tailored. So to, to your point of the breakout session, as I rack my brain on and try and find the the talking points, uh, I'm, I'm a person about so what. Mm. When I talk and interview with clients or prospects, or when I was a training manager teaching other advisors back in the day, yeah. I said, don't talk for the sake of talking. You get to talk to Cody, what's the so what? Mm -hmm. Right. You're talking to an audience. What's the so what? Don't have diarrhea of the mouth and don't just keep blabbing, but have a so what? What's the point? And so I'm, I'm trying for your a breakout session, your event, 8% nation, everybody. That's is that an eight. That's an eight. That's an eight percent <laughs> nation. Um, are you selling or are you solving was the headline that I came up with in the sense of what's separating you from your competition? 
Yep. I want to talk about overcoming adversity, the head trash. I mean, I got a lot of little note cards with a lot of different topics on there. Playing to win, being an octopus. Um, yeah. You know, all, all those types of subtopics that I'll bring into my so what's. And hopefully it resonates with those in the audience that can gleam a couple of those takeaways. Yeah. Uh, you, you know what? One of the things that's attracted me the most that you've talked about already is the retirement planning seminars. Like I'm a big event guy. My dad is doing seminars. His company's, his team's doing seminars every week, like, you know, Medicare. Um, how, 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 how impactful were those retirement planning seminars back in the day? I was literally the first. This, I'm from central New Jersey. Right, okay. the New Brunswick, Rutgers, Princeton area. Uh, nice. Fifty years, and I got paroled. I went to Florida, and I made the pilgrimage. There <laughs> down, you go, down to the down south. Um, but around 1997, I started these these seminars, and it was a dinner seminar at a local steakhouse, a local restaurant. And I kind of had mm. a strategy, and I had a discipline that I executed. It was a wedding style invitation, and it was my topic was your right to financial dignity. And I talk about the journey, life's journey, and getting to the finish line called retirement and having enough assets and resources that retirement is optional and affordable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, I had a lot of colleagues that I started with in the business and they were not doing this. They were still stockbrokers and I was a financial planner. I was a financial advisor. I did the insurance side. I did the investment side. My colleagues from Merrill Lynch were strictly doing investments. They, they didn't know from the insurance side of things and planning, not yet anyway. Um, and so, you know, it takes money to make money, but I was investing, and again, this is 20 plus years ago, right? So between 25 and 50 bucks a head, and it was a couples only event, I tried to keep the singles out, and, you know, I had my language, you know, first time attendees only, and I kept a database, uh, act for Windows, <laughs> if people remember what Act was. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and so if Cody, I don't know your wife's name, but if Cody and Mrs. Lauren. Adkins, what's her name? Lauren. If Cody and Lauren are signing up for my seminar, I'm now cross-checking my database. And I say, Cody, listen, uh, I see you attended last November. Hmm. I appreciate that you signed up, but it's for first-time attendees. It says so on the invitation, right? Couples only, first-time attendees. I said, however, I'd love to take you out to dinner. We'll talk privately. We'll follow up. You obviously didn't take me up on the consultation last time, but you wanted to come to the dinner again. It's the same exact presentation. Why don't we get together? My treat, I'll take you and Lauren out dinner again, and we'll have a private conversation. So that was my way around the plate liquors to keep the repeat offenders from coming. Repeat offenders. <laughs> well, that's what they were. So let's see, 1997 till about 2010. Right. So what is that like 13 plus years? Ask me how many people took me up on that second free dinner. <laughs> the answer is none. <laughs> They're platelets. They're platelets. Insane. But but you need a system, right? If you're paying 25, 50 bucks a head, 100 bucks a couple, marketing, uh, mailer, you know, 10,000 piece mailers, you know, five thousand dollars at the restaurant, you yeah. you put the events, right? You you need ROI. And so for me, it was just whittling down and letting people self-select of coming in the door and coming to see me. And again, my numbers, I was getting about a 75% conversion of a lead at the end of the dinner because the story and the conversation resonated. And the ask was just to keep the conversation going. There's nothing mm. to sell, only problems to solve. So right. what can we do to solve those issues? If I have five hotbed topics, long-term care, retirement, investment rate of returns, uh, you know, pension maximization, if you have a pension, whatever those topics were, something I spoke about had to hit at least on one level, maybe two, maybe five, but nobody walked out of there saying, I don't have those issues. Well, you're lying then. I mean, you're just, you're here for a steak. That's okay. Ruth Chris makes good steaks and have a good night and goodbye. Cost of acquisition. Is, but, is, that, what, is that where you did the the, the, the seminars at Ruth Chris? Towards the end, it was Ruth Chris in Princeton. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dang. So 50, 50 bucks ahead. Baller, uh, it, it you know it's Princeton, so you're trying to get yeah, you know yeah. a little higher. I, I didn't start there; I finished there later on uh, right. in the career. But you know there were some local local restaurants I used initially um, in the '90s. But again, the the point of it is you have to invest money to make money. 
right? Everybody has their process. I started as a cold caller in the day, literally as a phone book. I know you, your dad, others have talked about the generation of the 80s where you were cold calling out of a phone book with a ruler. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, you know, right down the list. And, you know, making that pitch, you know, Boiler Room doesn't lie. The movie Wall Street doesn't lie. Like, this is what we did. And eventually, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to make cold calls, right? I was a person of interest before the term in the sense of, I'm going to do these dinner seminars. I'm going to go to a higher level. You know, here, here's this hidden lesson. One of the many times and different sessions I may have gone to over the years, you know, award banquets or whatever, and I'm sure you've heard it, is identify your A client. Now the term is avatar, but what's your A client? Yeah. And replicate your A client. That's it. So for me, in central New Jersey, where we had corporate America, Wazoo, right? J&J's worldwide headquarters, Pfizer, Merck, uh, AT&T, Lucent, Exxon, Mobile. It was corporate America. So the millionaire next door literally resonated in every neighborhood. Mm. If you worked at a company in central New Jersey, uh, most parts of New Jersey, but central New Jersey where I was from, you, you could be there 30 years and be the, and these were clients of mine, the local maintenance man retired with a million dollar 401k. Wow. And he was nothing more than a maintenance man. He wasn't an executive VP. He wasn't, you know, Johnny got rocks with a hundred million dollar stock option package. But so the millionaire next door existed. And so I lost my point. <laughs> my point. You're good. That, that normally happens to me. That normally happens to me. You know, what I, what I've noticed though, that happens to a lot of, uh, Big time thinkers, you know, that, that are moving fast and accomplishing a lot. We just get going and and like we just have a lot in our brain. We have a lot of tabs open, you know. Well, I'll I'll, I'll take that excuse, but it's also going to be 58. <laughs> so. There you go. But what I, I was. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I mean, on, the, on this thing of sell, selling versus solving and, and what do you think was the one single thing? If you had to pick one thing that was the biggest separator, which allowed you to do four hundred thousand dollars on one single case. If you had to pick one single thing, what would you pick? As far as skill set goes or just? Anything. Wow, that's a great question. Um, let's, say, let's say it's skill set. Well, I, I, I would, I think it goes back. It goes back to a desire to want to help people. Again, I got a lot of different cards here, right? I got my someday aisle, which I'll talk about. And, uh, yeah. you know, when, when I my, my when I started in the business, my dad was not necessarily a business person um, in the sales capacity, but, you know, he was uh, uh, in leadership and, and management. But he said two things to me. He said, I hope someday you pay a million dollars in taxes. And I said, why on earth would I want to pay a million dollars in taxes? He said, because you made $2 million. <laughs> That's one. True the that, other yeah. is, the other is, you can cut a person's hair many times. You can only scalp them once, mm. right? So you want them coming back, right? So yep. over my career, the industry consolidated where, uh, not to be disparaging to the name of Merrill Lynch, but they wanted a higher ilk client. Yep. If you didn't have a million dollars, they didn't necessarily want you as a client. And as the financial advisor, they wouldn't compensate you if you worked on a client worth less than a certain value. Mm. So it discouraged you from working with, again, 80-20. We were talking about 80-20 before, right? So 80% yeah. of your client base coming from, right? So my sweet spot was a 58 to 62-year-old getting ready to hit retirement and me helping them get to the home stretch. That's where I brought the most value to a client. Not that I don't want a 30-year-old Cody Askins who's on his way up and has some some needs and and would you take me? Would you take me? You know, I'd consider it. I would consider it. Can I, can I go on the can I go on the plane? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If, but rule number one: if your 30-year-old client owns a plane, the answer automatically is yes. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. How about that? You know, my kids my, my son's 30. I hate to tell you, my son's 30. He he don't own a plane. There's you a good know. exception to every rule, you know? Oh, absolutely. That's why <laughs> don't judge a book by the cover, right? That's right. And, and to go back to this $5 million guy yeah. for that $400,000 case, if you saw this guy walk in to the restaurant, overalls, I mean, he didn't have a straw in his mouth, but this guy was as, might as well. I'm not trying to be disparaging, 
but you would not have labeled this guy is worth five million dollars. Mm. You would have been like, sit over there, be quiet, and enjoy your dinner because you're yeah. clearly not dressed for success, right? But you blow your mind when he pulled out and he said, I'd like to talk to you, and here's what you got. So you, you can't, Cody, right? Millionaire next door, you can't. But a lot of a lot of people do that, you know. I mean, I used to do it. Like I, as a as a as a life insurance agent, I would pull up to a trailer, you know, and be like, "Oh my gosh, here we go!" And I would walk out of there with like three policies for like seven hundred a month in total premium. And I'm like, "Well, I didn't expect that one," you know. So you just never freaking know. You don't know. To to come back, I don't know if it's the exact point I was making before, but my most loyal clients, my most referring to me back clients. Yeah. With the people that started on the lower end of the investment spectrum that I never had my nose turned up to, that I never said, hey, you don't have enough for me. You know, if you don't have X, I can't help you. I took any client, any time, and I still to this day, you want to do $10 a month for term insurance? Mm. I'll sign you up. You want to be on the HSA, uh, not the HSA, on the, on the marketplace for ACA, and it's only a $50 referral fee? I'll sign you up. I will help anybody anytime, no matter their economic disparities, the dis, sorry, discrepancies. And so that always served me in the sense yep. of, you know, and my deliverable of what you asked earlier, what separates me, you know, where did you get and how did you get is to help versus hamster. It just, look, I, I, I was going to save some of it, but, uh, my folks divorced when I was eight. My mother died when I was 22. My mm-hmm. mother lived on someday aisle. So I was raised by a single mother that died when I was 22 from cancer. So my mother never got to someday aisle. And so when you talk about your explanation of services and why you do what you do, and I had to do this deep soul searching, was I was out to help everybody realize nothing is guaranteed. You could be dead at 45. Why are you waiting? What do you need to be put in place to have your financial comfort to retire or do whatever you want to do where work is optional, right? And I think that foundation came from having lost a mother that never got that opportunity, right? And so at 23, starting as a young stockbroker and becoming this financial insurance advisor was just always, somebody needs help. Not everybody knows how to get it themselves and we're here to help. And that's that's the epicenter of Weinstein Wealth Insurance Solutions. That's the epicenter of what my wife and I do with our business. And we'll help anybody. But you got to give us the opportunity, right? That's right. I like Weinstein Wealth. That's cool. That's got a catchy, fun name. Uh, and you started stock when you were 23? 23. 23. 1986. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. Well, well, uh, last question, okay? Yeah, thank you. What, what, does, what does this... The other part of the wristband, which is at CodyAskins.com. What does this mean to you? Except responsibility. That's one of my cards, actually. Is it really? Uh, well, it, it says here. Can you read that? What's this point say? inward, point inward, not outward. That's good. S- same, same concept. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Is you, you, you know, here's the other one. Are you playing to win or are you playing not to lose? Mm. right? How many people out there, I don't want to do blank, or I'm afraid to take this, or if I spend that money, I won't be able to whatever. And so you can't play, it goes to the seminars, right? Is you had to invest the money. Maybe you put it on a credit card. Maybe you expend money you don't have, but the results, I mean, I can't say I made 10 times my money back then, but if I spent $10,000 on a seminar back then, I got a hundred thousand dollars worth of business back. No doubt Mm -hmm. about it. And eventually the business moved into a fee-based away from commission type of relationship. So now just think about the health insurance and the Medicare that has renewal income, a fee-based advisor. Well, I don't need a new sale. I just need to maintain my critical mass and let it grow and manage attrition and keep stacking. So any business, doesn't matter what you're in, in a sales role capacity, any business needs three to five years to get to critical mass. That's right. You're not going to make it in six months. You'd be yeah. a flash in a pan. I started at Merrill with no connections, no relationships, no daddy with money, no daddy with friends at the golf course. Right. And I cold call and I've been a grinder since I'm five years old, right? 
But I started with guys that were connected. And they came out of the gates. And they were top, top, right out of the gate. And six months later, I'm doing laps around them. Because they were done. They used the few deals they had. But I was grinding. I was cold calling. And I was getting business. And right. the uh, my training class at Merrill Lynch was 175 people, September 1986. Wow. By the end, that's one month. That's how many people Merrill were bringing in the doors. Wow. About 150 to 180 advisors nationwide a month, over 2,000. By the end of the next year, there was 10% left. Mm. 10%. So it's it's not a joke. It's They hired mm. and trained, and they're looking for the cream to rise to the crop. And I out of 90 advisors in my office, we had about 30 rookies. And again, this is 87, 88, the market crashed. I was number one in new accounts. I was number one in business. Well, we're not talking, you know, major, major money back then, but for a young person grinding from zero, I just worked my ass off and worked hard. And so the the drive, the determination, the the perseverance, to your point, again, coming back to some of this, is to not just not give up, but keep expanding, keep evolving. And yes. move yourself forward, adding more and more and more. And you have to have the capacity, obviously. But if the clients are in need of it, you better know about it. And, and then you'll be valuable to them. And then the, I think one of the biggest keys to my success is that my clients come back to me knowing they need an accountant, they need an attorney, they need a guy to sell them a plane. They know I know people. Right? I tied that in. You like that? Thank you. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Uh Actual last question. Do you believe anybody can be Bruce Weinstein? No. <laughs> Just you. <laughs> no. I'm a unique, I'm a unicorn. Um, no, I mean I'm I'm half tongue in cheek, but I've seen a lot of people come and go into business. Yep. And 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 I'm seeing them today, right? I'm still yeah. seeing them, I'm still seeing them come and go, and, and you're dealing with a lot of them. And kudos for you for what you're doing. And look, you guys got my attention six months ago, and I've Dove all in with you and how we how did we get it six months ago? That's what I want to know. How'd you how did I find it? Yeah. Facebook. Okay. Facebook. Uh probably a combination of uh Justin and the gurus and Bradley right. and Hustlers. And but you know, I was seeing I was seeing all the uh cross pollination of all you guys. And right. it led me, it led me with the Camperts to come to SWAT. And to go from being out of the room to in the room to now at 8% being part of the room. And there we go. To, I hope to keep evolving that and be part of the room. And uh, uh, out, of the, out of the room to in the room to at the head of the, to hit the head of the room. Head of the room. I'd love, I to, mean, I'd love to be a keynote at some point. I'd love to, oh, dude, you're on your way. That, that, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a concept right there. Like most people are out of the room. The winners notice they want to be in the room. Then they get in the room and then the real winners, like the real freaking heavy hitters, they're in it. And they're like, how do I get up on stage? I was VIP, right? I got in for VIP at, at 8%, yep. or not 8%, sorry, SWAT. And there's Pete and there's Brad. And I, I've been talking with Brad a little bit because I'm in his, the HST side for, for our health insurance, right? Nice. So he and I had some slight communication, told him I'd be there, so make sure you say hi. But I went up to Pete and I shook his hand. I went up to Marlon, I shook his hand. I, I went up to introduce myself to everybody. That's awesome. And I wanted to just, not that I want to be known, but I want to know who's up there. And I and I even joke with Pete the second time I ran into him, like, you know, I've been licensed longer than you're alive. <laughs> so, and Pete and I have been, we've had a one-on-one, -on -one, we've had some private conversations, but yeah. You know, I'm I'm a sponge. I mean, I met Zig Ziglar back in the day. I've been listening to Brian Tracy and Nightingale Conan, and I've been a yeah. student of the game. And I say the game of sales and marketing, no bull selling, and all that stuff. Yeah, books on tape, cassette in the car, everywhere you went. I didn't listen to music. I didn't listen to Howard Stern. Mm. It was always cassette tapes on some sales motivation. And and sharpen the tool, right? Sharpen the tools in the toolbox and be better. I love that. Am I perfect? No. Do I Dude. talk too much? Probably. You're as, close as, you're as close as it gets, you know, to be a perfect. Close? I, I mean, he I, can close. He's a closer. I don't, I don't, but I don't need to close. It closes itself if you do it there right. There you go. So selling yeah. or solving, you know, selling or solving. You see this pen? <laughs>
<laughs> Sell me this pen. All right, Bruce. Thank you, Cody. I one, impress, it. one impressive dude, man. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm look. I'm, I'm telling you guys, get to know this cat, look him up, and get day percent and watch his breakout. See you there. Hey, if you enjoyed this, I got another one you're gonna love. It's right there. Click on it. See you in there. You generate a ton of inbound leads from social media, from Facebook, mm -hmm. organically. Yeah. Like referrals friggin' galore. Mm -hmm. You are the king.